turning to class 11, our second to last class, where we take on the last two chapters of volume two on Marx's reproduction schema. On the one hand, are lauded as one of Marx's most important contributions to economics. Some people trace the birth of macroeconomic growth theory to these ideas, as, as well as citing this as one of the first two-sector modelings of the economy that exists. But on the other hand, there's quite a bit of controversy over uh, you know, what Marx intended uh, these reproduction schemas to show. And I'm wondering, given his kind of lack of framing around the discussion of reproduction schemas and the fact that we know that they're kind of put together from two different treatments, how do you understand what, what Marx is, is trying to get at with the reproduction schema? What work do they do uh, in his argument? You often have to read Marx for little clues as to and very often these clues occur in occasional sentences here and there and as you know I'm often prone to look at footnotes and things like that to extract actually an explanation of what he's doing because it's buried in a footnote somewhere. There are some passages towards the end of the reproduction schemas where he kind of says well this whole system could possibly be in equilibrium but uh, if it is so, it is purely by accident. And that uh, the possibility of it remaining in equilibrium is really pretty remote. And so he does say that at, yeah. some, at some point. So what I would read into that is that what he's trying to do here is to say what it is that capitalism should do, would have to do if it wanted to survive in a crisis-free mode in order to show that it can't possibly be in that crisis-free mode, given uh, the nature of capitalist social relations and, and uh, the way the market system works and how individual capitalists are going to do all the kinds of things they do without any kind of discipline being uh, exerted uh, upon them. So I, I see him as sort of really talking about the, uh, something that would be necessary for capitalism to achieve if it wanted balanced growth, but it never will achieve. Mm. Uh, that's, how, that's how I generally interpret it. And there's evidence in the text which, which you can point to that says that that is the way he's thinking about it. But he becomes so enamored of the, you know, trying to figure out exactly what it is that he forgets to kind of mention this. Uh, throughout uh, much of it, so it does make it seem, as uh, somebody like Rosa Luxemburg complained, that uh, you know there can be balanced growth forever. Uh, now there is another controversial aspect of it, it which is that uh, the suggestion that in a communist society you could indeed achieve balanced growth by using these as planning tools, and indeed uh, in the early Soviet Union and. Uh, some of the five-year plans that were laid out in India and so on have, have actually used, tried to use a framework of this kind uh, for uh, a planned, uh, centrally planned uh, economy. So the sort of history of the utilization of these things is very interesting, both in terms of socialist but also in terms of uh, capitalist uh, dimensions. Now, in Marx's time, of course, there was no attempt at macroeconomic interventions in the economy. And the growth models which, you know, to some degree came out of these formulations, the Howard Domar model and, and, and so on at the end of the 1930s into the 1940s and then growth theory in general attempts to create a, a sort of initially a Keynesian framework for macroeconomic modelling which would stabilise the economy. And of course these are much more elaborate models than the one that uh, Marx laid out. But the idea is there in Marx and I think many people have uh, appreciated it even if they have failed to acknowledge it. I mean, Keynes uh, knew about it but didn't know about it. He never, he never, uh, he never acknowledged the significance of these, uh, of, of Marx's contributions. Okay, so uh, we're in the middle of uh, the reproduction schemas, both uh, uh, simple reproduction and expanded reproduction. Um, of course, they're terrifically clear, yeah. easily understood, so I really don't have to say anything, right? Um, I mean, I think w one of the things we have to do is to sort of sit back and say, all right, well, what, what's, the, what's the framework here? And, and, and then sort of speculate a little bit about what the purpose is, because uh, it's not uh, at all clear entirely what Marx's purpose is.
you can only infer it. Um, the, the, the framework is, as we talked about last time, is that Marx divides the economy into two departments. And yeah, he messes around with the third department of luxury goods, but doesn't really go that far with it. But it's basically, it's a two department model. And the two departments are producing means of production and consumer goods. And then he's interested in trading relations. And really, there are two kinds of trading relations which get uh, talked about in these chapters. And it's a bit like if you thought of these two departments as two different countries, you would say, okay, there are trading relations inside of the country and then trading relations between countries. So there's trading relations which exist inside of a department producing means of production and trading relations inside of the department that is producing wage goods. And then there's trade between the two departments. Now, I think the fundamental argument is really about the trade between departments, but there are several sections where he spends a lot of time talking about the trading that's going on within departments. And in department of producing means of production, you have a slightly complicated kind of situation in which uh, means of production are being produced to produce means of production. And it goes on ad infinitum. And sometimes those means of production are produced within a particular sector. And Marx is, uses the argument of, well, uh, you're producing uh, corn, uh, and so one of the means of production of corn is corn seeds, and you produce the corn seeds, and then you save the corn seeds, and then next year you use the corn seeds. So corn seeds are your constant capital, which then passed on year by year by year. But most of the time what's happening is that there are particular industries or particular capitalists within, producing means of production who are producing the means of production for other capitalists. So that, for example, uh, the capitalist producing machinery uh, needs steel, or, so steel is an input into machinery, and so it goes on. The reason why Marx actually talks about this a little bit, uh, and, and it becomes even more significant in the section on expanded reproduction, is because situations can arise in which certain capitalists who are, uh, you know, want to consume those means of production, they want to buy a machine, say, but they haven't got the money to buy it. They need actually two or three years to save the money, so we get that dreaded war word which is corrupt up throughout Volume 2 of Capital a lot, which is hoarding. That you need to hoard money for maybe three or four years before you can buy the machine. During those years you may be producing, sending commodities out into the market and, and getting money for them, but you're not actually con consuming because you're, you're saving a part of what's coming in. So Marx is kind of saying, well, this produces the possibility for imbalances within, uh, and particularly within uh, the sector which is producing means of production. And you have all sorts of other issues that arise here which are about, well, what about repair and replacement? You're probably going to have to save up for that too. So the likelihood that, that, that you know, everything is going to be sort of hunky-dory inside of this sector called the production of means of production, the idea that that's all going to run smoothly is, is erroneous, and Marx kind of suggests that there are many possibilities for uh, disruptions and uh, in, 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 you know, inequalities, that there's too much demand or there's too much supply, and, and so we're going to get some real possibilities of uh, inequalities and, and, and the like, and, and those inequalities could potentially be the source of some sort of more major disruption. So, so throughout this you, we will find these sections where Marx is talking about the circulation of constant capital inside of uh, the sector producing means of production. The same issue doesn't really arise in the other, in, in the production of consumer goods, because there you will, you will find 
to the degree, as Marx makes very clear, not only is he assuming that the workers are not saving, and, that, and, and to the degree that he's saying that workers are always under pressure to spend what they get immediately, and to the degree that workers are paid by the week, so you don't find the same potentiality for disruptions in the sector that is producing wage goods, so Marx does not pay as much attention to the sector producing wage goods as he does to the sector uh, producing means of production. So one of the things that's going on in these chapters is a discussion of the internal trading that's going on in these two sectors. And sometimes it muddles up and gets muddled into the trade that's going on between sectors, and you can see uh, how that can also, you know, one can spill over into the other. But the main innovation here is to come up with uh, a model, if you like, of uh, the trade uh, between uh, the sectors. And it's very interesting here that what he does is to set out uh, a, a whole set of different calculations based on numerical calculations, which fr frankly if you go through one then you have to go through another, and and it gets into decimal points and all this kind of stuff, and you're kind of going, well, I'm not quite sure where this is all, all going. So I think we're going to try and simplify that to just, just one basic example. And the place where he does this, I think, uh, the place I would start from is on page 586. Where, where Mark, what Marx does here is to set out this schema of simple reproduction. We start, department one, we have this 4,000 uh, C plus 1,000 V plus 1,000 S. That's department one, which gives you uh, 6,000. And then department two, when he, when he does this first time round, is 2000 C plus 500 V plus 500 S, 3000. And he works with that one on simple reproduction. And what he works out is that this amount here, the 2000 C, has to be equivalent to that, and if we did that in this uh, kind of other way that we can do it algebraically, we would say that uh, uh, department one, it's uh, C1 plus V1 plus S1. Department two is C2 plus V2 plus S2, and, and which equals the total output, call it W, and that the equilibrium position is that C2 equals V1 plus S1. So if you want to do it algebraically, yeah, you do it like that. Okay, so that's the algebraic version of it. Now, interestingly, what he does when he's talking about expanded reproduction is that he changes the figures down here, and some interesting reasons why. Um, he changes the ratios. This means that the two departments are identical except that one is more capital intensive than the other. That is, the organic composition of capital, which you remember is the ratio of C over V, uh, is different in the two departments. This is two to one and that's um, uh, four to one. Now why he did that is kind of an interesting kind of, it's kind, of, kind of question. Now what I've done is to pass around this sheet, and I'm gonna, but I'm going to sort of go through it sort of as, as we go through. The question that arises then, and, and as, you, as, as you see, um, what, we now, what we now find in this is that there's not an equilibrium between this and this. Uh, that in fact, what we're now going to see, however, is a breaking down of the S into something different. That is, the big question that really arises in expanded reproduction is what are we going to do with the surplus value? So this is, if you like, the key figure. What do we do with this? And in expanded reproduction, 
what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take part of that and reinvest it. So what that turns into, and so this then turns into, as you reinvest it, at the end of the year, say, you kind of reallocate it in the following kind of way. You say, all right, we'll have 4,000 C, but we now have to think about the reinvestment. How much are we going to reinvest in extra means of production? And Marx kind of puts it this way, well, we'll have 400 C, and then, of course, we have, again, the 1,000 V, plus we need more labour power, and we need it in the ratio of, of 400, so it's 100 V extra, which is the delta V, if you like, so these are the delta times the extra amount, and this is the extra amount here. So, extra, extra, and then that leaves a residual which is left over for bourgeois consumption, which is 500S. Okay. So that is the reinvestment which is going on in Department 1. In Department 2 you have a parallel reinvestment strategy in which, again, you have the 1,500C, you then need some extra means of production, and you have 100 C plus 750 V, which is the original, plus the 50 V, which is, uh, and then that leaves you 600 S. In which case, we're going to be talking about, this is now equal to 4400, and this is now equal to 1600. So we've expanded this to 4400C, 1600C, plus 1100V plus 500S, plus, and this one goes 800V plus 600S. What you here see is that the equivalence which was initially required is set up here. So that is equivalent to that. So that is the equilibrium condition. That is the equilibrium structure of reinvestment in Departments 1 and Departments 2. Now what you do then is you then, what, what Marx then does in there and is to say, all right, well what does this look like in, in the second year? Well, what you do is you take all of those figures from over there and you bring them back over here and say, well, in the second year it looks like this. We're going to start off with 4400C and we've now got 1100V and if the same rate of surplus value operates and Marx keeps the rate of surplus value constant, now we've got 1100S and, of course, that means that we've got a total of 6,600 total. Similarly, in Department 2, we take all of those figures from over here and say this is the new production system which is in, going to be in operation, which is 1,600 C plus 800 V plus 800 S, and that equals 3,200. Now what you notice here is that the total output here is 9,000 and the total output here is 9,800. So you've expanded the system by 800 units in the second year. Now you then do the same to this again as you did up there and you get the figures that then flow on from that when we come over here. Uh, we look at it and we say, all right, we've got the 4400C and we there now need the extra C, which is 440C. Uh, we've got the original V plus 110V and then that leaves 550S and that is 4840. And the same thing we do with this down here. We get uh, 30, uh, sorry, 1600 C 
plus 160C plus 800V plus 80V plus 560S gives us 1760. And then we put this all together in a different kind of way. Uh, again, just uh, amalgamating all of this, so we end up with 4840C plus 1210V plus 550S. And down here we have uh, 1760C plus 880V plus 560S. And we again notice that that is equivalent to that. And then what I've done is to take you through year three and year four, and you just keep on just just keep on going. Now, these these sorts of figures are consistent with this simple algebraic formula that no matter what, uh, under conditions of uh, uh, extended reproduction, uh, C2 plus the delta C2 must equal the, uh, the, 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 the total of the, of the, of the um, it'll be the V1 plus the delta uh, V1 plus whatever's left over on the SO, so that we have that equation uh, system uh, uh, fixed. Now, um, these, 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 if you like, are simply, uh, you know, kind of a way in which Marx has worked out what it would take for the trading, the trading system between the two departments to keep the ratios right so that you didn't have overproduction in one department or underproduction in another department and vice versa. Okay. And he works these sorts of figures out and then, and then of course adds in various other complications and all the rest of it. But this is the basic uh, argument. And uh, is this sort of clear or are you kind of so bemused by all of the kind of adding things up and everything? Is you, you, you clear about this? I mean, it, it, it's not that hard, you just have to keep on going and sort of say, oh well, this, this you know, sort of, you okay with it? Right. Well, um, there are a number of issues that are then raised which I, I think I, I would like to uh, uh, sort of take up. Um, the first is really, really to, th to look at the nature of the assumptions which are embedded uh, in this in this system. And the first obvious assumption is that you can clearly distinguish these two departments. And it's very clear what is producing means of production and what is producing something else. And of course there are a lot of industries which are, where actually they're producing both. Uh, agriculture is a good example. If you're raising cattle and you're raising them to be draft animals, uh, then you're, you're, you're raising means of production. If you're going to eat them for meat, you're, you're, they're, they're in the consumption sphere. So, you know, but Marx is assuming that these, these, uh, these sectors are, are clearly distinguishable uh, from each other. Uh, the second thing is that he is, uh, and, and this comes up uh, fairly frequently, and I wrote some of the bits and pieces down, so maybe I'll try and give them to you. Um, he also assumes uh, that there are only two classes in society. We mentioned this last, last time. And at various points in the text he kind of says, well, of course there are bankers and landlords and, and uh, you know, and the state and taxes and all those kinds of things around. And, and the merchants may get in here and, and get into the trading game and all this sort of thing. Um, but then he, then he uses the argument and says, but at some point or other they all have to 
derive their revenues and derive what they're getting from the production surplus value. So if you like, he tries to legitimise what he's doing here very much by simply saying, saying all right, uh, all of those other sectors, the landlords for example, are essentially parasitic upon the production of surplus value elsewhere. The merchant, as we saw in the theory on merchant's capital, uh, actually derives uh, their income from a cut out of surplus value uh, production. So Marx is kind of saying, I don't think uh, by introducing all those other classes, I'm actually going to, um, I'm, I'm actually going to, you know, improve matters at all. I'll just muddy the waters so that we can't really see uh, what is what is truly going on. So the sec that second assumption, but the second assumption. Is, uh, about two-class society, you also make some assumptions about how those classes are going to behave. Uh, one of the things we assume is that workers uh, consume all that they get, they don't save. Uh, and uh, <coughs> as comes up uh, as you go through the text, this stuff about rational consumption on the part of the workers is also there. You assume they're going to consume in such a way as it, it matches what is being produced. Uh, so the, the sector producing wage goods is producing the kinds of goods that workers want to consume, or, or need to consume, and will consume. So there's there's assumption of that sort. There's another assumption here, which is, what are we assuming about capitalist behaviour in terms of reinvestment? Well, why are they reinvesting? And there Marx refers just back to Volume 1 and kind of says they are reinvesting because the coercive laws of competition force them to. So they're reinvesting uh, because of the state of, 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 of competition. And, but how they reinvest, and you know, why would they invest in, reinvest in exactly these proportions? It's not clear at all that there's any market signals that tells them what they are, or what they should be. There's no, there's no way, in fact, in which in, you know, individual capitalists operating in their own self-interest are likely uh, to, in aggregate to produce a result where the aggregate reinvestment in, in Department 1 is exactly what it needs to be in order to get this whole thing uh, moving. So we therefore get the real possibility of disjunctions between individual capitalist behaviour and even capitalist class behaviour and the requirements that would be there for uh, the reproduction of a capitalist system. So not only is there an assumption that there are only two classes, but we assume certain things about the behaviour of these two classes uh, in this model, which, you know, and to the degree that that behaviour doesn't exist, and that workers may save or may spend on things that, you know, other things than they should, uh, to the degree that that happens, then of course there's going to be a disequilibrium uh, which enters in, into the picture. I mean, he starts out this whole thing about the two-class economy on page 468. This whole thing he's going to deal with is about the reproduction, i.e. maintenance, of the capitalist class and the working class. And hence, too, the reproduction of the capitalist character of the entire production process. So he declares it's, it's a two-class thing. At uh, various points he mentions the possibility of there being other classes. So on 497 he says, the division of surplus value into different categories, the bearers of which appear alongside the industrial capitalist as the landlord for ground rent, the money lender for interest, etc., as well as the government and its officials, rentier, etc. These fellows face the industrial capitalist as buyers and to this extent realise his commodities in money. They too cast their share of money into the circulation sphere and he receives this from them. What is always forgotten in connection with this are the sources from which they originally obtained this money and continue to obtain it. So that's on page 497. Uh, and on page 580, uh, he says, since in this schema everything is the, in the hands of the capitalists and the two departments, and there are neither merchants nor money dealers involved, nor bankers, nor any classes that merely consume and are not directly involved in commodity production, it follows that. So we get this, this idea of the, the two-class economy and also certain um, behaviours. Um, 
We also are assuming in this, in this particular schema that everything sells, uh, all commodities sell at their value. So the, the, the trading that goes on now. In volume three of Capital, he argues that, that commodities don't sell at their values, they sell, they sell at something called uh, costs of production, prices of production. Um, but he doesn't consider that here, he just kind of says, OK, I'm going to forget all that for the moment, we're just going to assume this is, it's a straight uh, selling at values. Um, the other thing is that the technology, uh, of course, like all of Volume 2, is, is both stable, i.e., you know, it doesn't change, uh, and is productive. And by that in, I mean that uh, the, the, the technology has to be in a state where you can produce surplus value. Uh, so there is a minimum level of technology, if you like, uh, which is, which is uh, assumed here. Uh, but any technology is, which is adequate to the production of surplus value can be deployed here, and whatever it is is held constant. Now obviously that's not true, it's constantly, you know, things are constantly changing. Uh, he also assumes that the wage rate, or, or the value of labour power, is fixed. So there are no shifts going on in Department 2 in terms of the value of labour power. And that, of course, is partly a consequence of, uh, or associated with the fact that there's no technological change, so there's no relative surplus value being produced here, so there's no, uh, for that reason, but then the value of labour power also changes for other reasons, as we know. I mean, degree of civilization in the country, uh, you know, all those sorts of things. So the value of labour power is, is constant and, and doesn't change. And also, he insists at various points that you can't you know, deal with any kind of problem, he doesn't allow people to deal with any problems by, by actually screwing a bit more out of labour. Uh, he has a passage where he kind of says, well, you know, if, if the capitalists have had a hard time and they've lost something, then they try to actually recapture it by uh, doing nasty things to labour in, in the in the living space, uh, they, they extract surplus value from high rents and uh, you know uh, commodity uh, wage goods that are that are that are I don't know given a higher value than their real value. So, but he says I can't allow you. You know, I mean that may go on in society in general, but in terms of my theoretical model, it's not helpful. So therefore, I assume that the value of labour power is fixed, and and you have to actually acknowledge that. And he sort of says, well, you know, uh, bourgeois critics have complained that I'm being unfair to the capitalists. In fact, he says I'm being very fair to them. I'm not, I'm not saying they're screwing anybody at all. Uh, they're, 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 they're giving people the value of labour power. And so the model does depend on, on, on a constancy of what the value of labour power is about. Um, so the wage rate can't be. Um, uh, for, for instance, on 584 to 5, which is just before uh, in the bottom there, he says, well, Department 2, considered as a totality, has the advantage over Department 1 that it not only buys labour power but resells its commodities to its own workers. As to how this fact can be exploited, there are the most palpable data in every industrial country. Even if the normal wage is nominally paid, a part of it can in actual fact be grabbed back without a corresponding equivalent, in other words, stolen. This is what I call accumulation by dispossession in the, you know, in, in, in the living space. This is achieved partly by way of the truck system and partly by falsification of the circulating medium. This is what happens in England and the USA. But then he goes on to say, uh, this, we really can't accept uh, all of this because what we're talking about here is a real wage uh, and we see that in objective analysis of the capitalist mechanism, certain blemishes that still t stick to it and with extraordinary tenacity cannot be used as subterfuges for getting around theoretical difficulties. So, again, he recognizes that these, these <coughs> divergences exist, as, as also with the multi class kind of thing, but says that it doesn't, I'm, I'm not really prepared uh, to deal with that. He also assumes that annual, there's an annual turnover, and the annual turnover, you know, so we, we mentioned this last time, all of the kind of divergences that occur in turnover time. And he's got a problem with fixed capital, uh, 
and occasionally he tries to sort of embed uh, an understanding of fixed, fixed capital and repair and all this kind of stuff, particularly in terms of the circulation of capital in, in uh, Department 1. So he's, he's sort of concerned about that, but he, doesn't, he can't really find a way to, to deal with the fact that fixed capital may carry over from one year to the next, except to kind of say, well, actually, we, we could just simply calculate it in terms of wear and tear and all this sort of thing, but clearly it, it starts to have a very important role in Department 1 uh, when people start to think about, you know, Expanding, re uh, expanding production, but in order to do that they have to build a whole new factory and they have to buy machines and it needs a vast amount of hoarded, uh, hoarded capital. Um, so the annual turnover is, is something which is assumed. Uh, he also assumes that the economy is closed and so there's no foreign trade and this comes up very specifically on uh, page uh, uh, 544 where you may find a situation in which uh, Department 1 has either to contract its production, which means a crisis for the workers and capitalists engaged in it, or to supply a surplus, which again leads to crisis. Uh, of themselves, these surpluses are no evil rather than an advantage in capitalist production, however, they are an evil. Foreign trade could help in both cases. Uh, in the first, to exchange for means of consumption the commodities from Department 1, which are held fast in the money form. In the second, to dispose of the surplus commodities. But foreign trade, insofar as it does not just replace elements and their value, it only shifts the contradictions to a broader sphere and gives them a wider orbit. I think this is a very uh, telling way of putting it that actually uh, what I call the spatial expansion and the spatial dynamics mm -hmm. of capital, I would use this phrase to kind of say they never solve capital's problems, they simply expand uh, th those contradictions to a, a broader sphere and give them a wider orbit. So, there's no overcoming uh, the uh, internal contradictions of capitalism by what I would call a spatial fix, by going outside and you know, all this kind of stuff. You can't do it. And, and Marx, uh, in Volume 1, uh, in the Theory of Primitive Accumulation, the very last chapter of Volume 1 of Capital, is talking about the colonial system and saying basically what the colonial system does is it finds itself forced to replicate capitalist social relations. And insofar as it does so, it doesn't actually solve the internal contradictions of capital. And what Marx is doing there is disputing uh, Hegel in uh, the philosophy of right, where Hegel kind of starts to talk about the internal contradictions and says, well, there are two ways you can, you can maybe can do it. You can uh, uh, redistribute from the rich to the poor, uh, but then he kind of says, but there's not a, the rich don't have enough to actually satisfy a mass of the poor, so we can't do that. And then he kind of says, well, maybe colonialism is the answer. And so there's a kind of very interesting passage in Hegel's philosophy of right where he kind of says, the colonial system uh, maybe can do it, and he doesn't actually uh, then pursue that very far, but you get the impression that that's what Hegel's arguing. And Marx, of course, wrote uh, one of his key texts was a critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. And he doesn't actually critique these passages, but actually all this argument here, and also at the end of Volume 1 of Capital, that kind of says, you know, foreign trade doesn't solve the problem. It actually moves it, actually moves it around and, and spreads it to a, a wider, wider, wider scene. And this is also, of course, partly a, 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 a response to Malthus. Uh, Malthus, in his political economy, argued that there is an effective demand problem, and the effective demand problem can be solved two ways. One, by having a class of people who do nothing but consume. Uh, and, but the other thing is by foreign trade. So what Marx is, I think, is refuting certain kinds of uh, arguments that are, that are around in political economy as to what the role of, of colonial systems and imperialism and all the rest of it might be, li might be in relationship to uh, the co internal contradictions of capitalism, and Marx is again in this little passage saying there's no foreign trade. So this is, a, I think, a very, uh, you know, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is that the, this, this model is, has a lot of, you know, really, really restrictive assumptions in it. And, and to pretend it's realistic is, 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 is crazy. Uh, it's not realistic at all. Uh, and, and so I think that 
then the question arises, if it's, this is not meant as a realistic uh, explanation, then what, what is its purpose? Now, one of its purposes, which comes up several times in the text, I don't know if you noticed this, but several times in the text, Marx says things like, well, if, if the associated producers were in charge, or if, if you had a socialist economy, or if you had a socialized economy, we could rationally work out all of these relations and, and, and you know, but w what, we are, what we're trying to do is to realize uh, all of this uh, through a market process which is anarchic and co incoherent and, 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 and all over the place and, and where market signals are not likely to guide you in such a way as to do the correct reinvestment decisions to get yourself into equilibrium. So, the, the, if you like, the general argument tends to be, well, look, uh, this system, uh, these are the equilibrium conditions and it's pretty clear that capitalism can't uh, conform to them, therefore this is likely to be a source of crisis. But then we come to what happens when the credit system gets involved here. And that's why I think it's very, very interesting to read this chapter after having read the stuff on finance and credit. Because what does Marx say in those chapters on the credit? I mean, yeah, they're, they're pretty incoherent, but he does say, uh, I think, some very important ideas, has some very important ideas. For one thing, he says, look, uh, the credit system operates as the common capital of the class, right? And you then say to yourself, well, if it's functioning as the common capital of the class, why can you not imagine that somehow or other the credit system can somehow or other exercise a controlling power in relationship to all of this? Right? And remember also that the credit system uh, played a very crucial role in dealing with things like turnover times and, and, and conflicts and, in a way, the disparities that are emerging here between these two sectors are analogous to those that arise over differential turnover time. In the differential turnover time and the fixed capital you have a kind of temporal sort of thing. Here you've got, if you like, uh, a, a sort of almost, it's not really spatial, but it sort of is spatial in its metaphor, a parallel of two sectors which are interacting in a certain kind of, in a certain kind of way. Uh, and what we need to do is to find ways to coordinate uh, what's going on in one sector and another sector and maybe the signals are going to be uh, given uh, by, uh, by the credit system. Because, again, one of the things that goes on here is that there is no equalization of the rate of profit going on between these two sectors. They persist, and there's something very, uh, very odd happens. Not only is the system expanding, but when you ask yourself the question, well, let's look at bourgeois consumption, and you see that actually bourgeois consumption is looking rather differently. If you look at the one here, they have 500 to spend. This lot down here have 600 to spend on their own consumption. Here, this goes up to 550. This goes down to 560. So, the producers of wage goods are going to have to start to actually constrict their consumption a little bit. And so, so some very peculiar things start to come out of the, of the figures as to, as to what, what is actually uh, going on here. And part of that comes out of the fact that, that you can't take surplus capital from, from sector one and put it into sector two. Now, this then brings us, if you like, to the whole kind of question of what, what happens with the, with the credit system. And, and uh, let, me, let, me, let me get into that a little bit because I think it's uh, uh, very, very significant. If you go to 574, he says, if the surplus product directly produced and appropriated by the capitalists, and he has these AAAs and BBBs, you know, the AAAs are hoarding and the BBBs are not, 
Uh, it is, however, absolutely unproductive in its monetary metamorphosis as a hoard and as virtual money capital that is formed by, by, bit by bit. In this form, which is the hoarding form, which is here called virtual money capital, it runs parallel with the production process but lies outside it. It is a dead weight on capitalist production. The attempt to make use of this surplus value that is being hoarded up as virtual money capital, either for profit or for revenue, culminates in the credit system and papers. In this way, money capital maintains an enormous influence in another form on the course of the capitalist system of production and its prodigious development. He then kind of says, if you go to 576, as production expands, the formation of new money capital keeps in step with this expansion, and so the material for its hoarded form has also to be present. If this is true absolutely for the early phase of capitalist production, where the credit system is accompanied by a predominantly metallic circulation, it is just as true too for the most developed phase of the credit system, which still has metallic circulation as its basis. Of course it no longer does, of course, but in his, life, in his time it certainly did. On the one hand, the extra production of precious metals, according to whether this makes them abundant or scarce, can now exert a disturbing influence on the price of commodities, not only in the long term, but also within very short periods. On the other hand, the whole credit mechanism must constantly be engaged in restricting the actual circulation of metal by all kinds of operations, methods, technical devices, to what is relatively an ever-decreasing minimum. Well, it's now gone to zero, of course. Though this, is, this also increases in the same proportion the artificial character of the entire machinery and the chances of its normal course being disturbed. And then right towards the bottom, it is important above all, however, to start by assuming metal circulation in its most simple original form, since in this way the flux or reflux, settlement of balances, in short, all those aspects that appear in the credit system as consciously regulated processes, present themselves as existing independently of the credit system, and the thing appears in its spontaneous form instead of the form of subsequent reflection. So Marx wants to use the metallic circulation process, because he sees that the credit system, for the reasons that we discussed, on the one hand it's critically necessary, on the other hand it is also uh, a potential source of, of, of disruption and speculative uh, craziness. So this, I think, is, 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 is significant. And then if you go to 580, and this is where he talks about the, these fellows, uh, the, 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 the role of merchants and money dealers and bankers and so on, um, but then only to, to dismiss them. Um, and then uh, there is a, uh, a quite longish section uh, where he talks about uh, the question of uh, credit again. Um, towards the bottom of uh, 544, we also get into a situation where there's going to be perpetual relative overproduction. On the one hand, a greater quantity of fixed capital is produced than is directly needed. On the other hand, this is particularly important, a stock of raw materials is produced that surpasses the immediate annual need. This is particularly true of means of subsistence. Overproduction of this kind is equivalent to control by the society over the objective means of its own reproduction. Within capitalist society, however, it is an anarchic element. So you get this notion of anarchic element, and then what we, what we start to see is uh, the way in which uh, capitalist production uh, it draws in uh, a whole set of uh, questions about the credit system, again, again on uh, 554 at the top. He says, in this presentation we have presupposed the exclusive circulation of precious, precious metals as money, and together with this the simplest form of cash purchases and sales. Though even on the basis of simple metallic circulation, money can function also as a means of payment and actually has functioned in this way historically, and a system of credit and certain aspects of the credit mechanism have developed on this basis. And then again, uh, bottom of 555, there's a very interesting passage where he kind of says, 
Well, when you're looking at the fluxes and refluxes of money which take place on the basis of capitalist production, the advances of fixed capital, he talks about those, he talks about hoard formation that is completely different in nature from the hoard formation based on the new gold production of each year that accompanies it, the different lengths of time for which money has to be advanced which vary according to the length of the production periods of commodities and for which there has been in each case a prior formation of a hoard before the money can be withdrawn from circulation by the sale of the commodity involved, the varying times of advance that arise simply from differences in the distance of the point of production from the market outlet, as well as the variation in the size and period of the reflux according to the condition of the relative size of the production stocks in different businesses and for the different individual capitalists of the same line of business, dates of purchase, all this. All these different aspects of the spontaneous movement had only to be noted and brought to light by experience in order to give rise both to the methodical use of the mechanical aids of the credit system and to the actual fishing out of available loan capital. Now, what I want to signal by this is that actually there is a very ambivalent relationship in these chapters uh, to how to position the credit system in relationship to what's going on. And it's pretty clear to me that by the time you go through and you sort of pull out all of these little squibs about the nature of the credit system and what it's about, that if you wanted a realistic model of how this whole thing works, then there's no way you can come at it in terms of a realistic model uh, without actually invoking and, and starting to integrate into it uh, the way in which the credit system actually transforms many of these basic relations. The other uh, place where there's uh, I think a very interesting intervention of the credit system, just to uh, consolidate that. Marx talks at the bottom of uh, 568 that there are several points at which money is withdrawn from circulation and accumulated in individual hoards or potential money capitals, uh, and that this appears as an equal number of obstacles to circulation because they immobilize the money and deprive it of its capacity for circulation for a longer or shorter time. And then he talks about the way in which the quantity of money you need is greater than that which is technically required. There always has to be a reserve of some kind. But then follows the little paragraph on 569 where he says, it is easy to understand the satisfaction evinced when the credit system concentrates all these potential capitals in the hands of banks, etc., makes them into disposable capital, loanable capital, i.e. money capital, no longer passive and as it were a castle in the air, but active, usurious, proliferating capital. So you get this language here which is about active, usurious, proliferating capital which is playing a, a very significant role in the quote, prodigious development of capital. So to me anyway, this relationship between what's going on in these accumulation schemas and what's going on in terms of the development of the credit system is very, sig very significant. Now, I've mentioned that the, these accumulation schemas are very uh, much admired uh, by uh, some economists, even though they would recognize that, you know, when you take the algebraic version of it, you can start to work and with very intricate mathematics. But the kinds of things you can start to do, of course, is to relax some of the assumptions. Not necessarily the two-class model, but certainly uh, the kind of question of what is the reinvestment function, uh, you know, what is the reinvestment uh, volume, and what happens when you start to relax the idea that uh, everything is internalized within either section, you know, department one or department two. And, and as you build the different mathematical models, you will find all kinds of things coming out. Um, for instance, if you go to uh, Michio Morishima's Marx's Economics, which is uh, a very sophisticated mathematical inquiry into uh, the qualities of uh, these schemas. Mid-1970s, he was probably regarded as one of the top mathematical economists in the world. Well, one of the things he discovered was that when you, uh, when you take these uh, schemas and start to play with them, 
you can start to see all kinds of different uh, dynamics, which uh, could be, uh, I think, very interesting uh, from the standpoint of the macroeconomic uh, uh, process of, of, of growth. For example, uh, one of the versions he, he constructed uh, was showed very clearly. As he says, uh, the balanced growth is unstable, and an economy starting from an initial point away from the balanced growth path will diverge from it as time goes on. In other words, there's nothing going on here which is going to bring you back to an equilibrium other than a crisis. Uh, and then he goes on and says, in more detail, we have explosive oscillations around the balanced growth path if Department 2, producing wage and luxury goods, is higher in the value composition of capital, or more capital intensive, than Department 1, producing capital goods. Otherwise, we have monotonic divergence from the balanced growth path. So, depending upon the value composition of capital, or the organic composition of capital in the, in the two departments, uh, you either get uh, uh, sort of oscillations which are kind of going like this, uh, or in the other case, uh, where Department 1 is more capital intensive uh, than Department 2, then you get monotonic divergence, which is a gradual sort of divergence from a balanced growth path. But I think Morishima, in particular, is very clear that he sees Marx's intent uh, to show the impossibility of balanced growth in a capitalist uh, society. And that, therefore, this gives an, an added role to what crises are about. Uh, crises are about bringing you back to some kind of equilibrium position. Uh, that's, that's why crises are, are functional, if you like, internal to capitalism. That, that they, you know, a non-crisis prone capitalist system uh, is not feasible. Uh, that what and this is Marx's conclusion, and to some degree Morishima is agreeing with him, uh, that uh, the, the, the market system and the decision making that goes on inside of a market system is going to be of such a sort uh, that uh, you're going to diverge from balanced growth and you're going to create a crisis, and the crisis is then going to say, well, how do you get back into some kind of balance? Now, of course, what then followed was. Uh, macroeconomic thinking of the Keynesian sort, which kind of said, well, actually, we, if we have the right kind of policies and we pull the right levers, uh, then we can actually get balanced growth uh, over a, a sustained period of time, uh, precisely by pulling the right levers. And this was, if you like, the theory that uh, operated uh, after World War II and to some degree, if you look at the growth path then, there were not the fierce business cycles that there had been uh, before World War II. And to some degree, people would argue that actually that came about in, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one was there was macroeconomic policy making, which using these kinds of, this kind of thinking, uh, was able to sort of say, all right, there seems to be some imbalance here, then what are we going to do? And you would use the taxation system, uh, or you would use uh, um, sort of, uh, you could, in some cases you'd use subsidies, uh, or you would use uh, the state to push up, for example, the, the demand for consumer goods, uh, you would try to stimulate uh, certain patterns of consumption, uh, in this country, for example, through suburbanization and the rise of a, uh, a sort of a homeowner society, that you would use those kinds of uh, those kinds of strategies to stabilize uh, the whole system. And, and between 1945 and 1973, uh, there were certainly uh, problems at various times. There were serious kind of recessions, but at the same time, there were also. Uh, if you like, the, the, the main business cycles, particularly around fixed capital formation. Uh, before World War II, there were usually long cycles of fixed capital formation, uh, 15 to 18 years kind of uh, cycles, but they seem to disappeared in, in the uh, 1950s and 1960s. 
uh, partly through macroeconomic management. Now, since, of course, the 1970s, uh, we've not been using the same tools and not the same macroeconomic management, although in some instances that's there, and you certainly see it going on in China right now. Uh, but uh, the tendency has been to kind of say, well, let the market do it, and we just use monetary uh, mechanisms, and you know, we don't try this uh, game of Keynesian in interventionism. But I think that, that Marx himself uh, is uh, periodically going back into this kind of idea that actually, um, for instance, uh, you know, way back on page 500, this is where he's talking about the internal kind of movement of constant capital. He says, if production were social instead of capitalist, it is evident that these products of Department 1 would be no less constantly redistributed among the branches of production in this department as means of production according to the needs of reproduction. One part directly remaining in the sphere of production from which it emerged as a product, another part being shifted to other points of production, and so there would be a constant to and fro between the various points of production in this department. So he's saying that social coordination is, is possible. And that idea comes up uh, a number of times uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in these two sections. Uh, which suggests that, I mean, I earlier indicated that the theory of, of capital that Marx is using here is very much about the idea of the social relation between capital and labour in production, and that therefore uh, the essential kind of anti anti Marxian antidote is worker control of, uh, by the associated workers uh, controlling the production process. But here, again and again, he's suggesting some social mechanism has to exist uh, to somehow or other direct uh, decision-making, because uh, you know, worker-controlled entities are not necessarily going to be in a better position than, than say, ordinary capitalist entities uh, to act in such a way as to somehow or other deal with the macroeconomic requirements of a sophisticated and complicated society. And I think one of the issues that we would therefore have to face in any kind of question of, the anti, of an anti-capitalist transition is precisely the kind of question of what kind of ways can coordination be set up. And it's always been presumed uh, that the coordination would be done through the state apparatus. Marx doesn't actually make that claim here that the state is going to do it, but then the question arises, if the state does not do it, then how is it going to be done? By what mechanisms? And that is where I think actually Marx's argument again in the credit section is kind of potentially interesting when he kind of says, well, joint stock companies uh, could have the capacity to do this sort of thing. And actually if you look at, at uh, the way in which uh, large corporations uh, producing means of production uh, actually organize their inputs of other means of production, then they don't go and get them through the market. They essentially have a kind of uh, uh, a sort of a commodity chain structure in which they basically send orders down through the commodity chain and say we need so many tons of steel and the steel people say they want so many tons of iron ore, and so there's a sort of a chain of command. So a lot of capitalist organization right now does actually address this kind of question by forms of, of, of what you were talking about earlier, kind of cooperation of a certain sort, but it's not cooperation in the sense of uh, equality. It's cooperation in the sense of a command and control structure in which, uh, say, uh, a particular corporation which wants so much of this or so much of that and so on will send out through its, to, to its subsidiaries, its filiaires as they're called, its subsidiaries, you know, how much we need. And if you can organize it then on a just-in-time kind of flow process, you can eliminate many of these, these questions. So one of the interesting kind of questions, I think, which arose out of that what seemingly crazy kind of suggestion in Volume 2 of Capital, that we should look for the joint stock company as the beginnings of a, uh, the socialization 
of the production process could in fact be sort of revitalized right now by kind of saying, well, let's look at how many of these large-scale companies actually organize, deal with this whole kind of question of the circulation of uh, goods within Department 1, for example, and whether there's ways in which it can be done without necessarily having the state intervene, but that uh, particular producer uh, will announce to all suppliers. And actually this issue is coming up even in some of these radical organizations now called solidarity economies. If you have a solidarity economy and you're producing some goods and you're in southern Brazil, you may need supplies and you find another solidarity economy in northeast Brazil and say, well, actually we need so many of this or so much of that uh, in order to produce what it is we're producing. So there's beginning to emerge, as it were, coordinating mechanisms which could be coordinated through the internet and so on. In this case, it would be coordinating mechanisms between, uh, between units which are, are relatively uh, egalitarian in relationship to each other, and that would be the, the theory of a solidarity economy, but you can also imagine a situation where, say, somebody who's producing a final product but needs the inputs, uh, you know, the inputs people can't sort of say, well, we'll think about it, you know, maybe we'll send it next week or two years' time or whenever we feel like doing it, you know, the, there's a certain kind of set of obligations that, that have, then have to uh, arise. So I think the, the, the sense of of, of, of this, for me, uh, would be very much around this idea of somehow or other uh, recognizing or recognizing that in a complex society there are coordinations that need to be established if we are not to, you know, end up with chronic inefficiencies and if we're not going to end up with, uh, you know, bad timing which is going to mean overproduction of this and underproduction of that. Uh, so the big, big question, it would seem to me, which uh, has been really, uh, I think, put on the back burner uh, for a very long time, is because we're no longer allowed to talk about planning. You know, I mean, that's that's a bad word. I mean, you know, uh, that's a socialist or something like that. And you have these very interesting kind of conversations when I was when I was at Oxford. I used to sit down with, you know big name people at dinners sometimes and they didn't know who I was, you know, and they would talk. And it, it's amazing when they get an Oxford High table, they talk about all kinds of things they wouldn't talk about normally. And I was having a dis discussion with a guy about who was complaining about the transport system of Southeast England. And I kind of said, well, you know, you mean you want better planning? He said, no, 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 we don't want any planning. No, no planning. <laughs> no planning. Uh, and so I said, and, and then I said, well, what do you want? And he described what he wanted. And I said, that sounds to me like planning. He says, no, no, we don't want any planning. No, no, we, we just need, we, we just need, uh, I've forgotten the exact phrase, it was something like, we need uh, the coordination of compatible and incompatible interests. And I said, oh, that sounds like planning. And, <laughs> and of course this was the high point of Thatcherism, you know, so you couldn't, you, but the thing, the thing here is that actually, yeah, at this point, at this point, if you're looking at like something like, and this was one of the big problems in South East England at the time, that Margaret Thatcher having abolished the London County Council, or the Greater London Council because it was socialist, the result was there was no coordinated planning for the South East England. And the result was the transport system was getting in a total mess and a total muddle and nobody knew, you know, and, and, and actually the business folk were having a hard time, they couldn't get to work on time, they couldn't live in their Sussex uh, mansion, and, 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 you know, so, uh, they, were, they were beginning to rave on and on and on about the inefficiencies of everything, and that's where you sort of get this coordination of compatible and incompatible interests. I, I, so these, is, these issues arise, and, and, and I, I think that actually at the, at, at the macro level, the, the, there is also a kind of question of, of, of can you actually intervene in a national economy in some way where you can deal with these sorts of questions. For example, the Chinese, there's no question that they are intervening in a massive way uh, in the macro economy along these kinds of lines. Uh, but there's a very interesting feature here of these particular schemas, which is carried over into the socialist folklore. That is, the leading edge in this is Department 1. In effect, what you see happening through here is that Department 2 is always adapting to Department 1. Now, this, 
there's no rationale given here why that should be the case. Uh, and, and in fact, there's no reason for it to be the case. You could just as easily reverse it. But the result of that has been that from the Stalin era onwards, all socialist planning has been really pushed by the idea that actually the production of means of production is the first place you really start and then everything else will follow. That therefore, and if you look at the industrialization uh, projects that were launched in the post uh, in, 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 you know, in, in post-colonial societies, you look at uh, the industrialization projects that were launched in Ghana and in Nkrumah or wherever, all of them were about get your heavy industry in place. Uh, the Indian uh, development plans were along those lines too. And in fact, uh, one of the people who used this, this structure uh, was an Indian planner, Mahalanobis, who, 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 who used this kind of structure to start to think about the Indian uh, five-year plans. But there's, there's, there's a certain mythology that kind of says, you know, get your, get, get your heavy industry in place and your infrastructure's in place and everything, so you, you, you've got to take care of department one and then, you know, don't worry about department two, the consumer goods industry, that, let, let, don't worry about that, that'll come later. Okay. And that's not necessarily the right way round. And now the Chinese, right, in response to the crisis, has been a vast infrastructural project, which is precisely about Department One investments. So there's vast investments going in to fix capital, infrastructures, uh, building factories, building whole cities. There's a vast amount of that going on. And at some point or other, you find that there's a real problem in the consumption sector, which is not doing very well. So in the United States, for example, consumerism accounts for 70% of the GDP. In China, it's 35% of the GDP. So obviously the Chinese are working with a development model which is seriously biased towards a department one kind of strategy. And this has been going on since Stalin, and it's been going on in all the socialist countries, and it was adopted also not only under so, so developmentalism in the third world uh, and, and the post-colonial world was very much driven in this kind of way, and a lot of it didn't work. If you look at the sort of industrialization project of Ghana and building steelworks and all this kind of stuff, it, it didn't work. Uh, and and so there's a real there's a real set of questions here. Uh, as to how we read this, but then also in terms of the political uh, message we might take from it. Uh, and as I say, there's, there's, you know, in reading this, going back to the original, there's absolutely no reason given why Department 2 should follow in the wake of Department 1. No one given at all. It's just that Marx arbitrarily decided that, to do it that way around. And you think what well, the history would have been if he'd arbitrarily decided it the other way around. I mean, no, it's, it's very, interesting, very interesting. So, these things, this, what's going on in these chapters is not harmless, has not been historically harmless. In fact, it's been, and it's not Marx's fault, but it's the way it's been read, I think. And, and so, so, I think that, that's one of the things that we ought, we ought to, again, think about. So, there are these um, features, I think, of this, uh, of this uh, text, particularly these, these chapters, since they have been taken so much notice of uh, by macroeconomic thinkers. Uh, but also it does pose this problem, which I think is a, a very significant problem of how do you coordinate uh, all of these you know, flows in a world where you actually drop a lot of these assumptions that Marx makes. For instance, no foreign trade. Well, what happens when you start to kind of look at the dynamics of foreign trade and, and, and imbalances that occur uh, there. So, you know, we, we have, a, if you like, a, a set of problems which are being identified here, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that many of you are kind of feeling, well, this is so abstract, I can't see how it actually relates to daily life. And that's true in a way, but on the other hand, I think you have to kind of stretch your minds to kind of say, well, what what is it that's going on here that we really need to be thinking about? If we are actually interested in the kind of politics of an anti-capitalist transition and what that anti-capitalist transition is being about. And for example, people on the left don't like this way of thinking at all these days. 
I think that's pretty fair, right? I mean, I, you know, well, most, most of the radical thinking to the degree it's anarchist and to the degree it's autonomista and it's, uh, you know, solidarity economy kind of stuff doesn't want to think about the macro kind of coordinations that might be required and necessary. And then you kind of say, well, what, what makes you believe that, that actually you know, individual, uh, say, anarchist communes acting in their own self-interest and their liberty and freedom and all that kind of thing are actually going to do a bunch of things which are going to coordinate with each other in such a way that the whole world works well. And everybody gets fed and everybody has a house and everybody has decent health care and education. What makes you think that? And I think that, that what Marx is doing here is, is, is by raising this question of what's the relationship between what individual capitalists do and, and what the, the macro requirements are, I think we also would have to ask the question what do individual decision-making units of any sort do in, 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 in relating to some of these more macroeconomic kind of questions. And we can see what some of those macroeconomic questions are when you get to issues of you know, energy, global energy use and global warming and all those kinds of questions, where in which case you have to start to think about how these macro questions uh, get facilitated. So I think volume two, in, in concluding on this, on this note, is actually raising uh, a, set of, a set of very, very significant uh, uh, questions. And, and the problem, of course, is that it's raised in such a way that it's very difficult to grasp actually what the hell's going on. And Marx is kind of sort of pushing in all sorts of little bits and pieces at the edges about this or that. He's refusing to consider uh, some, of the, some of the real possibilities that might exist via the credit system or via state interventions or something of that kind that might actually therefore deal with uh, some of the macroeconomic instabilities that he's clearly identifying here. But I think there are some very, very big kind of issues which are posed here and which we need to find some way to consider. Now there are some particular bits and pieces that I'd like to draw your attention to which are kind of interesting. And let me, let me just mention a, a couple of them in the text. On page 516, Marx is, is talking actually about, uh, he's, he's really talking here about uh, Adam Smith. He says, they say that the same money here realizes two capitals. The buyer, the capitalist, converts his money capital into living labor power, which he incorporates into his productive capital. On the other hand, the seller, the worker, converts his commodity labor power into money that he spends as revenue, which is precisely what enables him to sell his labor power over and over again and thus to maintain himself. His labor power is thus actually his capital in the commodity form from which he constantly draws his revenue. Now, some of you may encounter something called human capital theory. Right. right. Actually, Adam Smith had this kind of theory. And, but in Adam Smith it's sort of understandable because you know, human capital theory kind of says that the laborer uh, can, you know, by training themselves and learning skills and all this kind of thing, can build capital inside of themselves and then can get return on that, that capital when they go into the market in some kind. Okay, so human capital theory. And, and Adam Smith sort of uh, felt that was the case. And you can see that in, in an artisan society that might sort of work that I work for somebody and I internalize all these skills and this kind of thing, I learn how to do things and then I go out on my own and I become a, a little capitalist uh, because I've got those skills and I can actually convert those skills into you know, commodities and then, and then become a capitalist. So the transition from being an artisan worker to being a capitalist was very, very fuzzy. You know, in, particularly in the 18th century when Adam Smith is, is writing. So in a way you could understand why Adam Smith would have that kind of uh, idea about things. But by the time you get to the mid-19th century, uh, that independent artisan class is being kind of essentially more and more destroyed, if not totally destroyed. And, 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 and Marx, of course, will have nothing of this idea that actually, uh, and then he explains why. Uh, with this human capital theory. In point of fact, he says, labor power is his capacity, ever renewing and rep reproducing itself, not his capital. It is the only commodity that he can constantly sell, and he has to sell it in order to live. 
but it operates as capital, variable capital, only in the hands of the buyer, the capitalist. So the point is that the labourer can't make use of the skills and the abilities, the capitalist makes use of them. And so if the labourer is twice as productive as other labourers, then it's the capitalist who benefits, not necessarily the labourer. So Marx's point is kind of saying, you know, to, to call you know, the labourers' skills their capital is a ridiculous proposition. So when people started to pick up all of this and started giving you all this language about human capital theory and what's the big guy in Chicago, Gary Becker, yeah, in Chicago, starts talking about Harry, you know, starts talking about human capital theory and that therefore, you know, we've got to invest in human capital and education and it's all about capital and then you're giving people capital which they can then Marx is saying that's no that's rubbish. Uh, you know, so so you know, and, and, and actually what, what Marx does in this little passage is is to take a crack at uh, uh, human human capital theory and, and and, dis and dispute it. So I think it's kind of, kind of interesting to sort of go off and, you know, look at what uh, is being said about uh, human capital theory and then, uh, and, and, it's, and it's so different. I mean, it, because if, if, if it really was capital, uh, the work, and, and it generated a revenue, then the worker could just go to sleep in a hammock and presumably just get the interest on it, right? <laughs> Marx is kind of, of course they can't do that. So to call it capital is ridiculous because that choice is always open to the capitalist, right? Say, oh, I'm fed up with working now. I, I just, I've got my, I've got my, I've amassed my capital. I'm now just going to live off the, the revenue, and the interest. You know, so, so I mean, the capitalist got that choice. The worker does not have that choice, and this is Marx's point. And and uh, you know, so so it's, it's a very. It's a very interesting little passage where he's, he's, he's essentially refuting uh, Adam Smith's notion of human capital theory, which is taken up by Gary Becker and made a big thing of in, in, in a lot of contemporary uh, economics. So that's one of the little snippets in here that I think is uh, in interesting. I think the, we've already dealt with the foreign trade stuff and the question of hoarding. Um, and there's one other thing that I think uh, I'd like to pay attention to, which comes up uh, on, on page 591, where Mr. Capitalist, as well as his press, is frequently discontented with the way in which labour power spends its money, and with the commodities too in which it realises this. On this occasion he philosophises, waxes cultural and philanthropises, as for example Mr. Drummond, the British Secretary of Embassy in Washington, the Nation carried an interesting article, they still do carry articles like this by the way, uh, in which it is said among other things, you know, and then goes on about how working people have not kept up in culture with the growth of invention and they have had things showered on them, I mean this is amazing stuff, which they do not know how to use and thus make no market for. And then further, the problem remains how to raise him as a consumer by rational and healthful processes not an easy one, as his ambition does not go beyond a diminution of his hours of labour, the demagogues rather inciting him to this than to raising his condition by the improvement of his mental and moral powers. Again, that's going to be capital, uh, human capital kind of argument. And then Marx mocks that by kind of saying long hours of labour seem to be the secret of these rational and healthful processes, which are to raise the condition of the worker by improving his mental and moral powers and making a rational consumer out of him in order to become a rational consumer of the capitalist commodities, he must, before all else, for the demagogues prevent him, begin by letting his own labour power be consumed irrationally and in a way contrary to his own health by the capitalist who employs him. What the capitalist understands by rational consumption is shown when he is condescending enough to take a direct interest in the consumer behaviour of his workers, i.e. in the truck system. And then he talks about the Lawrence Mills and the boarding houses and, and, and all those kinds of things. The description of the ever-present piano, the working girl boarding houses. Um, so I think that this, this question of uh, working class consumption, what it's about now, what Marx is doing here, of course, is again kind of saying, look, uh, the bargain between capital and labour in the, in the market is simply this, we give you the value of your labour power and that's it. 
then you have to work out what it is you need to survive. That's your problem, not mine. So this is, if you like, what we would call the externality kind of side of things, which I think I've mentioned before, the externality of social reproduction, which the capitalist class wants nothing whatsoever to do with. But, at the same time, there is the presumption, always the presumption, in, in, in this model that the working class are going to spend it, are going to spend their money, and that they are going to engage in, quote, rational consumption. Rational, that is, from the standpoint of what it is the capitalists are producing. So that, that it, built into these models is, 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 if you like, a theory of, of rational consumption on the part of the working class. And there's no escaping that, the, that, that there is a definition of rational consumption. But, but Marx is kind of saying that the, the capitalist is not actually concerned with that. All the capitalist is concerned with is giving people the value of labour power and that's fixed, and in these models it's fixed, as we mentioned earlier. And generally speaking, throughout capital, Marx tends to take it as fixed. And does so for a very interesting reason, which will come, you know, which was there in the first class, which is that the actual wages that are paid, that's a fact of distribution, and therefore it's a particularity, and therefore outside of you know, particular concern. So the issue that's raised here in this ironic way about rational consumption is a real issue. And so Marx is not denying the idea that there is rational consumption, he's simply, what he's doing is denying the way in which uh, the bourgeois do-gooders were in effect trying to define what rational consumption was, uh, and, and, and imagining therefore that actually the working class was having all this largesse sort of showered upon them in some way, and that they were not using it properly. Which of course was the question which was ra raised when Ford gave the sort of eight hour, five dollar, eight hour working day and then had to send in a lot of social workers into the workers' houses to make sure they consumed properly. Uh, you know, you didn't, want, you didn't want them gambling and you didn't want them, you know, all those kinds of things, it was not rational consumption. Uh, so, keeping the workers on a consumer, on the, on, on the right consumer trail becomes very, very significant, and you can see why that is from, again, from these schemas. Uh, if suddenly, uh, this money which is given out to this uh, 11, you know, 1100 V, and the, all the workers collectively decided to go you know, uh, blow it on a gambling spree or something like that, then, then the whole system would break down. And, and so, so, you know, I mean, this, this is a very interesting kind of thing, you know, and uh, it, it, of course in the, uh, in the, this is where the Russell Sage Foundation came in, uh, they were the social scientists that were hired to go into the workers' uh, houses and make sure they weren't spending it on sex and drugs and rock, rock and roll and God knows what, you know, I mean, uh, all, the things, all the things you guys get into, you know, sort of. So this idea is, is also something that's, that's very significant, I think, in, in here. Marx does talk about, uh, very periodically, he kind of says, we assume workers assume, consume. Uh, all, of their, all of their revenues, and they don't save, and they don't consume in a way that is outside of this dynamic. And that is, I think, a very important uh, 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 assumption. So, I don't, I don't take this as a dismissal of the idea of rational consumption, what I do take it as is a, a dismissal of uh, the idea that somehow or other, you know, we can go and, you know, some, some, somehow or other, you know, the, like bourgeois philanthropy in relationship to, uh, to working class consumer habits has been a long issue, uh, and a big issue actually through the history of the bourgeoisie and through the hap history of capitalist society. And it's always, uh, it's always surrounded with this kind of sense of moral superiority, if only these people would actually, you know, realise that by, by using their resources and building their human capital they could actually benefit, and Marx is kind of saying, both in terms of the human capital theory, but also in terms of the rational consumption, that's not going to be the case, uh, given the nature of the capitalist class uh, relation to, 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 to labour. So do you have any, any kind of responses to these chapters you want to 
Also, ja. Ich möchte etwas über die Koordination sagen. In meiner Erfahrung sind viele Leftes, die seriös in die kooperative Bewegung haben eigentlich bereits verstanden, dass soziale Koordination ein wichtiges Problem ist. I think it's the traditional split between the Marxist and central planning and the anarchist, just the small mini mini right. communities, that, that doesn't hold water anymore. Right. I mean, for everyone that, that really thinks about these cooperatives, because small cooperatives just faced with the market, they, they are drowned. They, they, if, if, there's, if they're not embedded in one kind or the other uh, of central, no, not of central planning, of communal planning, And so my assumption would be the real reason why Marxism and anarchism has split is not um, on the problem of coordination. It's on the problem that Marxism has not developed a theory how to democratize the state. This is the weak point where the anarchists say rightly the only thing that you provided is that kind of central planning that yeah. didn't lead to anything. But I think this lacking theory of how to democratize the state, just instead of just the idea we take, we, 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 we take over the state and then the state will wither away, uh, and this was not sufficient and not helpful. I agree very much about uh, you know, the way Marxists approached these kinds of questions, say, in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, which I think uh, was precisely problematic for the reasons you suggest. What I'm trying to do is, in, in reading this is to try to sort of say, well, okay, how do we, how do we then approach this, this, this question? Because I think the other side of it is um, a lot of uh, worker control movements and worker cooperatives have failed. Uh, the ones that have survived, and I, I mentioned uh, some weeks ago, the Mondragon one has survived. In part has survived because it has actually sought to take command over the credit institutions by setting up its own credit structures, and also to some degree has tried to integrate a retailing structure with a, you know, so they have, uh, so I think it's very, you know, very important to look at the, the, those that have survived. I mean, the, the whole history of worker control has, has been, um, yeah, successful for a bit. Uh, and uh, even, even as something as, um, you know, which had a lot of prospects for survival, like the Israeli kibbutz, has gradually sort of disintegrated until, you know, something that is radically different for a variety of reasons, but so I, I think, so I, I don't disagree with you, you know, about the, the line of, of, of thinking, but I think a, the, a lot more attention has to be paid to the theory of the transition, if you like, and what has to be built uh, in, a, in order to, to, to move towards a, an alternative kind of production and consumption system. Uh, and I think that Again, part of what I'm trying to read into Marx here is to kind of say there are necessary preconditions uh, for a transition to occur. I, I th I'm, I'm as suspicious of the state as, uh, as, as you are, you know, and I'm therefore not in favor of saying automatically, well, the state should do it. I, um, you know, but on the other hand, you have to think of some organizational form that has the capacity uh, to do it, which is why I'm saying, well, we should be looking inside of U.S. corporate configurations. One of my favorite would be we should look inside of Walmart, see how they actually set up their delivery and uh, service. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not a great, uh, you know, in terms of its social relations, it's a disaster and for all sorts of reasons, but in terms of its technical capacities to coordinate production and consumption, uh, it's, uh, and it's a massive kind of organization, you know, what would happen if we, had a collective uh, taking over of Walmart, yeah? I'm wondering if, because uh, this whole thing, you know, what we see about capitalism is this motion of value, this motion of yeah. exchange. Now, uh, how, 
I mean, if, if you go into, and I'm, I'm just asking because I don't know, uh, or like, you know, if, if, if value wasn't in motion like it was in feudal times and pre-capitalist economies, and then so say you have a post-capitalist economy, you know, one of the, one of the sort of more abstract things you can ask is, what is the, what is the relation of value in central planning? What, are the, what is the relation of these flows? I mean, it's still, I mean, it, you, you get into that paradox where like you want to centrally plan, but we still talk in terms of these sort of semi-autonomous flows and these, you know, the levers of, Keynesianism and central planning. So, I mean, at, at what point is is that does, does that value sort of is it still autonomous and you have to hands off and sort of direct it or where does how does that motion of value happen? Is that does that make sense? Forgive me. Yeah. No. I mean, well, uh, Lamarck's answer, and you know, is that uh, money would disappear and that therefore the value form would disappear. What that would mean is that the coordinations would have to be done in use value, have to be done in physical kind of terms. How many houses do you need? You know, and how many, you know, how much steel do you need? It wouldn't be a value flow. And this is the kind of interesting thing about what happened here. Remember, Marx at the outset kind of said, you've got to start, you've got to think about value flows and you've got to th think about material coordinations. The material coordinations here have disappeared, actually. And, and they, the only way in which they continue, they actually are present here is in terms of the distinction between means of production and, and, and wage goods. Two vast use, you know, material defined categories. But the use value is almost incidental to them. Yes, but the rest of it, use value disappears. So after that, that's where you get into the Leontief uh, kind of input output analysis. Physically, how much do you need? You know, how much steel do we need to produce to, you know, to build the bridges? Uh, you know, those kinds of things, and how many bridges do we need, you know, I mean, those kinds of things. So it's a, it becomes a use value. And you can do it in physical terms, actually. You, 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 really, you really can, and you can also, and there is a distinction which could carry over uh, between productive consumption and individual consumption. So you could continue to use some distinction of that kind and say, look, we need uh, we need, we need uh, commodities to produce other commodities that produce commodities that then produce consumption. But how, how would we model that? So it would become a physical thing. So, so Marx's answer, I think, it says a couple of times, so we wouldn't have money around to do these coordinations, so that wouldn't, we, so, so we, the, the, and the value theory would disappear. Now there's a, there is a, an important thing to understand about value theory in Marx. Um, it's, 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 it's distinctive to capital. This is, this is capital's value, way of valuing things. Socially necessary labor time. And one of the objections you would have uh, to taking some sort of that and then trying to use that in planning would be that actually you are simply perpetuating the capitalist theory of value in another form. So if you try to model it in value terms, you're actually using the capitalist valuation system to do it. So I, I think, um, and there's another notion, there are completely different notions of value that might be involved, which would be very disparate and wouldn't, be, wouldn't, have, wouldn't have the, uh, the capacity of the, the contemporary value operation, which in effect uh, has a factory open up in China and one in Ohio closed down irrespective of the, of the social and, and environmental and other consequences. You would be make, those decisions would be made on, on different grounds. So it's physical coordinations, I think, and, and, and also social determinations of what, uh, of what is considered a, a decent lifestyle by a mass of people, you know? I mean, what, what, what do we really need? Uh, do we need more and more and more? Or is there a sense in which we can say, well, this is an adequate uh, material base for, for, for daily life. Now we can, you know, have a, I don't know, a, a, a 10 hour work week and, and the rest of the time just, you know, hang around and shoot the breeze and do all those kinds of things instead of, instead of doing what everybody does now, which is run around like crazy, you know, sort of. So I think, so I think, I think that, that, that is the answer I, I, I see Marx proposing here.